for the final meeting of the semester. We're very happy to welcome Dima Rinkin from University of Wisconsin-Madison. The title of this talk is Hecke Category via Derived Convolution Formalism. Take it away. Okay, well, once again, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and let me also add that I, um, I'm not going to, I'm, I probably will not be able to see the questions that are asked in, in chat. So if, if I miss, especially if I miss something, but you think it's a good question uh, for me, please, please do stop me. Um, all right. So uh, let me start. Um, I, this is, uh, so I'm, I'm planning to talk about uh, uh, an approach to Sataki equivalence, more specifically to uh, derived Sataki equivalence, um, essentially by using the extra structures present on the category by using convolution. And uh, this is a work in progress. So you will probably see some uh, rough edges and all that. Uh, and it's joined uh, with Roma Bezorukovnikov. And uh, at this stage, it's joined with him pr probably um, Later, it might be joined with other people as well. So, uh, and uh, I'll start by talking about, um, well, just setting the question, really, discussing the uh, main object. Uh, then, um, as I already mentioned, the plan is to try to get as much as possible from the extra structures present in the story. So that's uh, the next step. Uh, then the main result goes under this, the main formal result, I guess, goes under this uh, keyword rigidity of the corresponding category. Uh, and then I want to, mm, uh, then I'll have to explain how this formal result applies in uh, our situation and I'll tie everything back together. All right, so let me start. So what, uh, do I want to do? Uh, well, the goal is really to describe the uh, spherical Hecke category. So, and here's the list of uh, conventions. Just let me just rattle, rattle them off. So we work with a um, reductive group uh, over a field K, which normally uh, and we're mostly interested in the situation where this is, where this is a finite field. Then uh, look at Laurent series and Taylor series. So uh, local field and its ring of integers. Uh, GRU stands for the affine Grassmannian. And, um, uh, and then we look at the uh, constructible sheaves on E, but uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, constructible sheaves on whatever with coefficients in E. So E is the notation for the field of coefficients. And uh, we are mostly interested in the case of uh, E being the finite field or rather it's, um, rather it's algebraic uh, closure. So, so it's the case of modular coefficients uh, and, but L is supposed to be well, the, the, uh, should be different from the characteristic of K. Now, the key point here is that the whole, that uh, it's here. So we're really studying the derived category of constructible sheaves. And that's why I don't really care whether I'm talking about constructible sheaves or perverse sheaves. So, so this is an intrinsically derived question. Maybe it's important to point this out. And so in particular, when I write uh, this quotient, this is the same as just looking, uh, this is another way, the sticky way of writing the equivariant derived category of um, the affine Grassmannian. And again, it's, it's important to remember that there, this comes with its own subtleties that this equivariant derived category is not the derived category of its uh, abelian category, which is of course why the whole story is interesting. All right, so um, now I, I said that we are mostly interested in the case 
uh, of uh, positive characteristic. This is because, um, well, the case when characteristic is equal to zero is pretty much known. But to tell you the truth, I am still interested in understanding better what happens in characteristic zero, just um, maybe even if that means reproving certain known statements, I mean, we reprove them by understanding better the uh, structure that's involved there. And so, yeah, so, uh, uh, so I'm still kind of curious uh, you know, to, it would be nice to know what happens in characteristic zero uh, and uh, uh, in which case it's also parallel to the demo story about D modules. So I mean, very informally, I think uh, I, my attitude in this talk is that I'm almost going to pretend like I'm working over the field of characteristic zero, except I'm not going to use any special properties about representations of, well, not of G, about representations of reductive group over E. So I will not, um, oh, maybe that's, that's a strong statement. But anyway, so uh, I want to say that uh, Basically, the characteristic of E doesn't enter into the discussion except at some technical places. Uh, but uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, the, the uh, that representations of reductive groups over E are not semi-simple. Okay. So, as I said, the plan is to describe this category. And now the problem is that, uh, well, that this is a hard question. Uh, and so, so it, it's not easy to answer. And the reason it is hard is because, uh, well, because it's naturally derived. So when I say hard, I really mean that it's derived because the, well, uh, one way to say it is that the proposed answer, which, um, and we'll talk about it later anyways, but, uh, the proposed answer involves uh, a derived object, so a derived scheme, and a related um, a related problem is that um, well, it's related, or it's a, you can say that it's the same problem, is that uh, the derived category, the triangulated category that we are trying to describe, oh, the, uh, oh, the uh, derived category that we are trying to describe is not actually the, the reconstructable canonically from its abelian category. It's not the derived category of the abelian things. Um, and in fact, in the abelian world, the answer, I mean, I, I say here that the abelian category is easy. Of course, it's only easy in comparison. So it's, I don't want to uh, make light of this problem. So it's, let's say, easy-ish. Can, can, can I just interrupt you to ask? Yeah, there please is, do. I no... was going to ask for questions in a moment anyway. Okay, sorry. There's yes. no system. You, you, or is it literally the Cotazan bundle of the classifying so, stuff? Sorry, it's, it's hard for me to hear you. Can you speak a little louder? Is it the classifying bundle of the, is it the, is it the derived the cotangent bundle of the classifying stack? Or do you include shift or it's literally point and point of G? Well, it's literally what's written, but when you take, okay. yeah, but well, when I write point, I mean their, uh, their identity. Okay, okay, good, thank yeah, you, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, right, and so, yeah, so in the abelian case, we don't see any of this derived stuff. Uh, and so if we want to describe just the, um, just the uh, abelian category, the category of G of O equivariant perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmannian, then uh, we have the, uh, well, the original um, geometric Sataki equivalence. So let's call it Sataki. Uh, due to Mirkovich and Vilonen in any characteristic uh, and uh, so this is uh, the statement is that this category of per uh, perverse sheaves with some coefficients is equivalent to the category of representations of the uh, Langlands dual group. Yeah, so G check is of course Langlands dual. 
um, with the same coefficients. And so, uh, and so the, you can say that a short summary of the, uh, of the plan of this talk is to uh, somehow bootstrap this equivalence and see how much you can get, uh, how, how much information you can uh, get about the derived category uh, from, mm, well, from the geometric Sataki equivalent, from the classical, so to say, Sataki equivalent, from the abelian Sataki equivalent. So what, uh, what can we find out about the derived category by looking at the um, abelian category? Um, is it making sense so far? Any questions? I, maybe I can also check if there is anything important going on in chat. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so let's continue. Now, of course, uh, the point is that literally I just, I mean, you might be surprised a little bit because I literally, I just told you that uh, this derived category is not reconstructable from its abelian category. So in order to get something useful, we'll have to use extra structures. And so this uh, extra st uh, structure involves convolution. And uh, when I talk about convolution, I mean um, the following, uh, I mean, the so to say the general uh, the general framework of uh, Hecke algebras and modules over a Hecke algebra. So let's first talk about it in very um, general terms. So if I have a group, and here you can assume that everything is finite dimensional, this is just motivation basically. So if you have a group and a subgroup, then you can look at the um, sheaves or rather the derived category of sheaves on double cosets, and that's going to carry convolution, which I'll always denote by star. And um, on the other hand, uh, I can, if I have two sub, uh, and then I can look at modules over this. Now, basically this um, will act on uh, sheaves. Uh, so if you have anything, if you, if you have X, equipped with an action of H, of the group H, then you will always have the action of this group, of, you have the action of this category on the category of sheaves on uh, the quotient by P, right? And so, and we are, in our case, we'll be looking at, uh, you can look at double cosets where you have two different subgroups P and Q. So, so if you look at, look at sheaves at double cosets for P and Q, then this will have a um, this will have an action of this Hecke category, and of course the situation is symmetric. So in fact, this uh, object will be a bimodule. On one hand, it will have the action of um, Hecke category for P, and on the other hand, the Hecke category for Q. All right, uh, and. We are specifically interested in the following uh, situation. So you already know two of the groups involved. There's uh, the uh, group of you know, the loop group and the group of positive loops. So in this case, the quotient is the uh, affine Grassmannian. And then uh, the second subgroup that we work with is, well, now we also want to look at Whittaker objects which means that the second subgroup is going to be the unipotent radical of uh, Iwahori, of the Iwahori group. So in the case of uh, GL2, you get something like this. And then, um, but we are not just going to take invariance under Iwahori, we are not just going to look at uh, uh, things on the quotient. Instead, we will fix a non-degenerate, uh, well, it's a character, non-degenerate homomorphism into uh, uh, the additive group. And uh, once this is done, we can consider the Whittaker subcategory uh, whenever there's, um, whenever you have a, a variety X acted upon by U. So really I'm treating this. So 
hidden behind this, uh, behind the curtain, I guess, is the uh, Artin Schreier sheaf, uh, the character sheaf on GA. So we pull, pull it back to you and then consider things that, uh, consider sheaves on X that transform under this, um, uh, transform under the action of U via this character sheaf. Again, I believe this already appeared in uh, previous talks in this seminar. So um, hopefully this is familiar. Okay, so, uh, so I'll just denote the Whittaker uh, subcategory as a quotient, but I'll uh, put this psi under the, um, under the quotient sign to indicate that that's that instead of invariance, instead of U invariance, I'm imposing this twisted invariance version. Okay, so this is the group, this is the two subgroups, and then we have three different double uh, corsets associated with it. And here they are. One is the object we are interested in, the spherical Hecke category, uh, where you take look at um, you look at objects on G of K that are uh, at sheaves on G of K or, or derived sheaves on G of K that are bi-invariant under G of O. Then uh, the, so, so to say the mixed version uh, when we, is when we look at double corsets on one side, uh, we require that things are G of O uh, invariant and on the other side, uh, the, we look at the Whittaker category. So this is uh, uh, so this is going to be unramified Whittaker category. And then we can also do uh, the Whittaker category on both sides. So this is the by Whittaker category. Um, so I wrote the same psi on uh, under the two quotients, but it's good to keep in mind that uh, one is the left action, the other is the right action. So uh, you can also think about it as uh, things uh, on G of K, on, as sheaves on, uh, on the loop group that transform under the action of two copies of U by the character which is Psi on one side and minus Psi on the other. And just like in the previous uh, setting, uh, we, we're going to have a bimodule. So this unramified Whittaker category has uh, an action of the spherical Hecke category on one side and the by Whittaker category on the other side. So, so this is the extra structure and uh, the goal is to use this extra structure to understand, um, well, to understand the uh, spherical Hecke category as a derived category. Does it make sense? Any questions? Dima, um, yes. so is this uh, is this kind of Iwo Hori Whitika? Um, if we go back to the previous slide, yes. or is it? Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, I I'm slightly worried. I didn't want to use this term because uh, uh, I was worried that it might sound like we take things that are Iwo Hori invariant on one side and Whitaker on the other. <laughs> and here we have sphere. It's like spherical Whittaker with Whittaker being in its Iwahori version. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think people used to call this the baby Whittaker. I don't know. That sounds a little bit strange, but uh, but this way the, <laughs> the confusion is um, removed. Any other questions? All right, so now uh, let me talk about, um, uh, let me look at the, um, well, at, at this setup in general. And in fact, let me, um, uh, let me dial things back a little bit. Uh, and uh, instead of looking at this in the convolution in the, mm, in the convolution in this, uh, Hecke algebra situation where we have uh, two-sided invariants. Let's just look at the convolution for a subgroup, for a group. So suppose that, um, so this is a model situation and um, I'm quoting uh, Boyarchenko and Drinfeld here 
but honestly this is probably the least um, impressive part of their paper so um, it's uh, I mean this is a relatively easy exercise so the relatively easy exercise uh, is the following that suppose that we start uh, with um, with a group and consider this uh, derived category of sheaves on it. And now um, I'm, I want to know if this category is rigid, which by definition means whether objects in it have uh, uh, admit duals, um, well, both left and right in case the category usually it is not, uh, not commutative. So not, not a tensor category, just monoidal category. And the point is that uh, this will happen exactly when H, uh, when H is proper. So more or less an abelian variety up to some finite stuff. And uh, I know we're mostly interested in uh, constructible sheaves, but just as an example, uh, let's look at, uh, Let's look at uh, the case of D modules. I, I feel like I want to mention D modules if I can in any talk that I give. And uh, the case of D modules, there are uh, somehow more various Fourier transforms that we can use to understand this uh, category better. So in fact, the point is that when uh, you can, on the one hand, you can look at D modules on an abelian variety, let's say on an elliptic curve, and then there is a, Fourier Lamont transform that goes from these D modules to coherent sheaves on um, uh, uh, on the universal extension of the uh, well, in this case of the same elliptic curve, and that's not important. What is important is that the uh, other side of the Fourier transform uh, is uh, is coherent. So we have something like. Um, something like coherent sheaves on some smooth variety. And the other thing that's important is that as it usually happens for the Fourier transform, the uh, convolution product becomes the tensor product. All right. Now, there are also versions of the uh, Fourier transform when uh, E is another, another commutative group. So you can, and perhaps the more familiar one is when uh, uh, when we look at sheaves on the uh, on the additive group, and then uh, the answer on the other side would also so then we have the usual Fourier transform uh, where the right hand side is well sheaves or D modules in this case again on the same group, and if you want you can also look at the multiplicative group where the right hand side will be something like difference equations. That's not the point. My point is that there is a significant difference, like there's a fundamental difference between the first example, oops, the first example and the uh, other two examples. And that difference is this, that um, in the first example, we had, uh, we had essentially coherent answer. In the other example, we had, in the other examples, we had some, something more complicated from this point of view, something like D modules or difference equations and so on. And so the fact is that uh, this category is rigid thanks to, um, uh, thanks to ser duality, while these categories are not rigid. So of course, there is a kind of duality for, um, uh, for D modules like Verdier duality or sheaves, but it's not strong enough to be it's like weak rigidity as opposed to strong rigidity. So, so this is, I think, this is a kind of demonstration of uh, this um, uh, of this uh, statement uh, due to Bayarchenko and Davenport. All right. So, if uh, we are planning to make a break, maybe now is a good time. Doesn't okay, great. Sense. Yeah. Yeah, so and it's... also, um, uh, this is probably more to the organizers, uh, but uh, so if uh, if you believe I should be moving faster or slower, 
<laughs> which I don't think is possible. But anyway, so if I should be moving faster, uh, uh, please tell me or text. Uh, it, it's very hard to do this without uh, without feedback or without much of feedback. So please let me know if there's something I need to know. Okay, let's take a five minute break. So we'll meet back at 3.33. Should I stop sharing or does it matter? Um, you can keep it on. Uh, it's very possible people will have uh, questions during the break and then you can go back on in your slides. All right. Resume the recording. Okay, great. Yeah, let's get started again. All right. So, um, yeah, in chat, Roma pointed out um, that my notation is sloppy, that um, really when I talk about uh, Coherent sheaves. I uh, well about this uh, in this Mellon transform situation. When I talk about coherence, this is a little bit similar to coherence over D modules. I I mean that it has to be coherent as a um, uh, that it has to be finitely generated as a module over difference operators, rather which is not necessarily um, now usually it will not be coherent as just a sheaf on GA the same way so it's really coherent maybe coherent over the difference operators i guess formally i can also say that i'm looking at uh, compact objects uh, in this category so all right anyway so uh, so this is i guess this is the prototypical statement and then uh, now i want to uh, generalize this, but first let me actually mention why. Uh, uh, let me not exactly prove it, but like I said, it's it's not very hard to prove. But let me let me sketch the argument at least. Now uh, the point is that duality, um, the dual of an object, duality for an object can be uh, formulated as a kind of adjunction property. So basically, you want the um, uh, you want uh, the dual, uh, well, you want to find the adjoint to um, to convolution with with an object. Uh, and uh, the usual adjunction for, um, so adjunction uh, for, for six functor, just purely formal calculation, would imply this, would imply existence of the dual. It would give you that. Uh, the only problem is that, that uh, the definition of the uh, convolution involves something is asymmetric because convolution involves push forward under some map. And there are two versions of the push forward. You can take the push normal push forward or push forward with compact support. Uh, and accordingly, like, you can convolution on the other, you use convolution with compact support. Now, of course, if H is proper, the two versions coincide, uh, and then uh, and then we get the required duality. So, so that's uh, a short summary of what's going on. Um, now, uh, let's ex let's develop this statement a little bit. So, first, instead of having a group, let's consider the situation where there's a group and a subgroup. And uh, then the corresponding statement is that uh, rigidity in the Hecke category would result from uh, the quotient being proper. And again, this is familiar. So there are some familiar examples. We can look at the spherical Hecke um, 
category, we can look at the Iwahori Heike category. So, um, or we can look at other situations anyway. And again, uh, the point is, uh, it, it's essentially the same argument uh, with the argument really being that um, convolution in this category involves integration over the quotient, involves direct, uh, involves push forward uh, along this quotient. And so if you know that it's proper, then the two uh, versions coincide. So now let's keep developing this. Uh, now we are more interested, so we're kind of interested in this setting or in the, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to call it the relative setting, but anyway, we, we look at the situation where uh, uh, we look at algebras, but we also look at modules over the algebra. So the corresponding statement, um, so let's have a statement in this context. So suppose that uh, I have, uh, so let, let's maybe mark things here. Oops. So suppose that I have H inside of it P and, inside, and also some two other subgroups that I don't care about. I don't know anything about them. Uh, and then um, the claim is that uh, I can now consider, let me consider the convolution, the, the version of the convolution that involves integration along this quotient H mod P, which I assume to be proper. So you can consider the convolution where uh, there's a double corset with P on the right, another double corset with P on the left, and then we integrate to uh, uh, along H mod P. Uh, then the adjunction statement still holds for the same reason you just have to be careful about what kind of adjunction you uh, adjunction or duality, however you want to call it. Um, it still holds. You just have to formulate it correctly. So really, the statement is that um, if you have an object on the left, then it has a dual. Uh, sorry, if you have an uh, object on the left, it has dual on uh, one side, so it has a right dual, and then if you have an object here, it has a left dual. And again, I think this duality is best understood. Uh, and you can you can uh, write what it means to be dual formally, like the, the formal definition in terms of units and co-units. Um, or you can think about uh, the convolution having an uh, adjunction. Like, for example, when I talk about uh, dual to f, I'm saying consider this convolution, fix the first input, consider it as a uh, functor from the second input to the output. And then uh, the question is whether the adjoint to this functor can be written as convolution as, as well. All right, so for people who like abstract uh, settings, um, you can also think about this in, the, in, in terms of a certain two category. It's not really necessary, so let me just go through this quickly. So this two category uh, consists of uh, schemes uh, with uh, some sets with an action of H, and then um, the corresponding, uh, so it's a two category, so morphisms between two uh, such sets would be just um, the derived category of the product of H equivariant sheaves on the um, derived on the product. So in particular, when X, uh, so one example of such X would be uh, this symmetric spaces, this uh, corsets, and then uh, double corsets will appear, or rather sheaves on the double corsets will appear as the category of homomorphisms. And then this, uh, Ex slightly extended uh, by Archon Kadrinfield statement uh, concerns adjoints to one morphisms in these two categories. Again, this is not really necessary, it's just a way to formalize this list. All right, now we come to the to actually maybe the most important statement of the talk. So, namely, it's all good. We, we talk, why do I care so much about this, um, about existence of adjoints? 
about or about existence of duals. So, so you can think of them as adjoints in this setting or as dual objects in this setting. Well, it turns out that it has an implication for the categories itself. Namely, uh, the claim is that uh, when you, you can consider this convolution as a functor between the appropriately defined tensor product of derived categories and um, this, uh, because this, uh, uh, so, so because you have an action of a um, monoidal category on these two components, you really can consider the uh, relative tensor product, the tensor product uh, of modules over this category. So, so this is, so far, this is just formality. The informal and uh, maybe surprisingly powerful um, statement is that under the assumption that H mod P is proper, this functor turns out to be fully faithful. So in other words, knowing this categories and this gives us, it doesn't give us in, uh, complete information about, uh, about the target of the tensor product, but at least there's a big chunk, the image, if you like, of this map that we understand completely. Okay, so let's see how it applies in our situation. So let's, I mean, unless there are questions. Uh, Dima, is it possible to say a bit more concretely what this um, tensor product of categories amounts to? Like, is it a, um, an object and a, an object together with some additional information? Well, yeah, here I think, um, so I'm uh, not talking about, well, like, let, let's not talk about it in full generality. So let's, uh, so uh, in this kind of situation, what it really amounts to is the following that I mean, it's generated by things uh, by, well, what we would expect the tensor product to be generated by. So it's generated by things like F1 tensor F2, where F1 and F2 are in this uh, two, um, in these two different categories. Uh, but the, the key point is that how to define homes in between such generators. So what would be a home from F1 tensor F2 to F1 prime tensor F2 prime? And uh, the abstract definition is that, uh, so, so basically goes in the following way, like the action, uh, this uh, structure of a module on the category. And again, I, I'm being sloppy, I'm ignoring uh, certain incompletions, so let's, let, let's not go there in the moment. At the moment, so this uh, structure of a module on um, uh, on these two categories allows you to take not just homes, but somehow um, refined homes. So uh, it allows you to take homes in this category, uh, which with o object being uh, this home will be an object in this monoidal category. And so the strategy for computing this, the formula rather for computing this home looks something like this. You have to take home from F1 to F1 prime as an object of this category, then take home from F2 to F2 prime as an object of this category, and then basically take their scalar product. So like convolve them and take homes from the identity object into them. I see, great, Can thank I you. You, you can avoid the infinity two categorical business uh, to make sense of that? To make sense of uh, which part? Of the what, of, what the, of the tensor, tensor product to make sense of the... Of the tensor product. I think uh, here, yes, because I mean, the, the somehow the two categorical business becomes important when you care about no morphisms between functors that are not necessarily isomorphisms. And if I'm trying to define, uh, I mean, if I'm trying to define the tensor product, uh, the universal property only requires dealing with isomorphisms of functors. But the tensor product itself uh, brings you in the 
No, in the two in at level two, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it, you can't do a time trial. If you want to do a time trial product, of, I don't know if you work with A infinity category. I mean, you can't define a time trial product directly of A infinity categories, for example. Even if it's not over anything, just an abstract. I mean, there, there are yeah. complications. Uh, so here it's even worse. Because you, so I would. I well, know, I mean, I'm definitely not working with triangulated categories here. Like you have to work with infinity categories. Sure. But you only need, I don't see why you need two infinities here. But okay, maybe we okay. should discuss, like if okay, maybe I'm okay, missing right, something, yeah. maybe we should discuss this later. Okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, yeah, so my, my point maybe um, since this question came up, maybe I should mention that the reason this theorem actually is related to this is that this kind of duality statement allows one to compute inner homes via convolution. So there's an obvious formula for the inner home that you want to hold. Well, you want to come up with, if you think about it a little bit. And, uh, but this, for this formula to be true, you need this. Okay, now let's try to put things together. So these are the categories involved, uh, the categories that we are interested in. Uh, so there's the, uh, the, uh, so I decided that finally I need some kind of short name for them. So there's the by Whittaker category. There's um, uh, this Iwakori Whittaker and ramified thing. And then there's the category I'm interested in. And I want to use this theorem. Um, well, uh, I, I, if I, I use this theorem essentially by uh, looking at W as a B module, and then uh, the theorem talks about the, uh, tensor the tensor product of W with itself over B uh, with the statement of the theorem being that this functor is fully faithful. Now, this is the general outline. Now I actually cheated a little bit. So the first part where I cheated is that, uh, I mean, really you have to be careful about left action versus right action. So uh, really, when I uh, write here W tensor W, I'm thinking about two different versions of W, one with G of O on the left and U on the right, and the other one the other way around. So this is slightly sloppy notation. This is one point. And then the other point, maybe a more crucial one, but it's easy to miss if you haven't, um, if you haven't seen this means before, is that I jumped, I somehow, uh, I, uh, I have a problem with this crucial assumption that a certain quotient should be proper because uh, for this statement, I would be looking at the quotient by the unipotent radical of Iwahori and that's not proper. On the other hand, I know that if I look at the quotient by Iwahori, well, that's int proper, so that's good enough. So. So the problem is the difference between Iwahori and its uh, unipotent radical. And the way to fix it is to shrink this category and work uh, with a category of sheaves that in addition are monodromic with unipotent monodromy under the action of the torus in G. So in other words, this extends, um, uh, this extends the condition um, well, before we just had uh, some kind of equivariance condition along uh, the unipotent radical of Evahori. Now along the torus, we require something weaker than equivariance, uh, but uh, it essentially, it has the same effect uh, that um, integration along, integration along uh, Evahori pretty much uh, integration along this quotient pretty much reduces to integration along flags. So again, I'm, uh, this is a little bit technical, so I hope you'll forgive me for uh, fast forwarding through this, but the bottom line is that actually I should be looking at certain monodromic category here. So, um, and now, of course, uh, for this to work, I need descriptions of these categories. And uh, one of them, I believe, has already appeared, namely this uh, Whittaker category is uh, described by the Kasselman-Shalaika formula in this version by all these people, by Pizukavnikov, Gates, Gori, 
Mirkovich, Rich, and Ryder, uh, because we are looking at modular coefficients. But the answer is simple. That this is well, relatively simple. This is just uh, the uh, category of representations of the uh, dual group G. Need to understand this by Whittaker category better, and I forgot this all important monodromy condition. This monodromy condition, more or less, adds extra condition on. Support version of uh, the um, uh, of the Langlands dual group on itself. So the equivariant condition uh, so I, I'll uh, maybe uh, I'll, I'll see if I have time to get to Ivan's question. I disappeared. Is everything? Can you hear me? Ah, good okay. again. Uh, good again. So, so did is everything fine, or did something? Uh, so, I, I, I think maybe we missed a sentence or two from you when I you see. were starting to address um, Ivan's question. Ah, yeah. Well, okay. anyway, the point is that uh, I, I'll see. Uh, I might, my maybe I'll, I'll get to it after the break. But yeah, it's it's an important question. But let me make sure that I get to where I want to before the break. Okay, and so yeah, so so you look at this, uh, you um, you have this uh, things that are equivalent under um, under the uh, adjoint action, this coherent sheaf equivalence under the adjoint action. There's also the condition this that they are supported on the unipotent cone. Let's not worry about it because it plays no role in this story, strangely enough. Um, and um, I want to say that this is a, mm, part of the project of uh, Bezrukamnikov and Drish, and I hesitated whether it's better to put, uh, whether, whether there are, I should put more people. I don't, but since uh, Roma Bezrukamnikov is in the audience, maybe he can comment. So if I'm uh, I definitely don't mean to omit anybody's name. All right. Anyway, and so, so that's the uh, that's the story. So to put things um, to try to draw this story is that uh, the Whittaker category uh, looks at equivariant things. Uh, G-check equivariant things on a point. The by Whittaker category looks at uh, things that are um, G-check equivariant on a larger variety, on G-check itself, on the Langlands dual group. And now we are supposed to take, uh, we are supposed to take the tensor product of these two categories and perhaps not very surprisingly, especially if you've seen these things before, this tensor product corresponds to fiber product of varieties, but because everything is derived, we're taking the fiber product in the derived world. So the answer to this category, what I want to write here would be uh, coherent sheaves on this fiber product, which uh, maybe the parenthesis should be somewhere here, which makes me happy because that's exactly what I wanted the Hecke category to be. That, that's exactly the, the form of the answer in the Satake, um, uh, uh, in the Satake equivalence. Well, honestly, that's a bit of a lie because uh, it's not true that these two categories coincide. And actually, if you follow things more carefully, you realize that, well, this word renormalization is here that uh, the precise uh, the precise statement is that these two categories are not equal, but they are similar, and the the um, statement on the um, coherent side is that 
instead of all coherent sheaves, we only get perfect ones. But on the other hand, we also know that coherent and perfect sheaves are, well, basically that any coherent, something perfect has, uh, uh, a perfect complex has a finite resolution, a coherent complex has an infinite resolution, but you can always uh, approximate infinite resolutions by finite resolutions. So it's not, um, so somehow the, the bottom line is that this map is uh, not an equivalence, uh, but it's sufficiently close to being an equivalence that you can actually explicitly describe this um, once you, that once you get this fully faithful embedding, uh, the fact that um, the Hecke category is, uh, uh, this uh, coherent category is almost, um, is relatively simple. Okay, yes. So I, I, I assumed so, but again, I wasn't sure. So thank you, Roma. Um, all right, and now basically to summarize things, here's, the, uh, here's what happened. So our goal was to understand something tricky, this derived category that's not, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's strongly derived in the sense that it's not reconstructable from its abelian category. The point was to reduce it to some uh, well, what I call the classical, or you can say non-derived equivalences, meaning things like, um, well, things like the uh, non-derived Satakia isomorphism, the kasselman shalaika formula, the, this formula for by Whittaker, they are all uh, perhaps complicated, well, somewhat complicated objects, but the point is that they don't involve any derived schemes in them. You can have G check acted upon by itself, but that's it. And then uh, what I talked about today is mostly what might be called abstract nonsense. It's the theorem that guarantees that this object that can be, com that can be computed from the abelian information embeds fully faithfully into the derived object, into this hard and mysterious derived object. And the last part, which I can say a few words about after the break, it's really quite simple, is that uh, this fully faithful embedding is close enough to be in an equivalence that you can recover the uh, output completely from uh, the target completely from the source. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, Thank you. Any questions for Dima? So I have a question maybe, I mean, so it's, yeah, it's a, I like very much uh, these categorical things. I mean, it's a great, uh, yeah, great way to get that. I was wondering, I mean, this, this uh, derived, uh, this product point times point, uh, um, you yes. can, uh, over here, it is it is uh, it's a cotangent bundle of uh, of the classifying stack. So, is there a, is there a way to uh, imagine uh, uh, another uh, way to make you this kind of ID work reducing to the ABN case by uh, by uh, somehow reconstructing this cotangent bundle uh, construction, uh, starting with just uh, uh, BG hat? I mean, is there a way? To, do, could you think of a way to make that work? Like, where would the cotangent bundle appear from uh, categorically? I mean, the I mean, bundle is no, yeah. If you think it as as a uh, with the Hamiltonian uh, with a subjective prediction construction, it really what you're doing a uh, point times point over. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, that's really. So it's just a slightly maybe different way. Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm just saying that. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I, I, I am not. I am not saying anything. I'm like thinking out loud. So that, uh, like, what would be the question? I mean, I should say that. Uh, maybe I can say something about it. Um, do you understand correctly that um, 
if you write just uh, zero times zero over the Lie algebra, that would be, the, yeah, that would be the Wow, ah, yeah, you're right. Uh, that's only. Oh. But it's here we, yeah, oh. here we say kind of one times one over the group, and I guess they if characteristic is not too small, they yeah, if characteristic is it. larger than the dimension. Huh? So it's not the same if the characteristic is smaller. Right. I mean, it's not, but I don't, I mean, I'm a little bit worried about small characteristic anyways. Formally, I didn't use anything, but I just. Yeah, no, but even if it's not small, then somehow. Yeah, it's less natural. It's less natural, yeah, right, which. Okay, I understand, thanks. No, but yeah, for some, for some purposes, maybe I want to make this identification. Right. Well, but I, mean, I think, yeah, what it's basically, I guess you can ask what naturally appears uh, on this side. And what does it, do you have the group or do you have the Lie algebra? And the answer is that you get the group because it appears as monodromy of as right. uh, action of some monodromy, which, which the, those are invertible things. Mon monodromy, yeah. Acting on nearby cycles, right? Yes. Right. Maybe uh, can I reiterate my question? Sure. So about monodromic shifts. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, I mean, roughly speaking, the point is that um, so. Uh, so it, it's, I mean, it, it, you're using something about the particular situation. So really you somehow, uh, you somehow saying that you have all, the, you have this various cells co corresponding to the double corsets for Ivahori. Uh, you can impose this condition separately on various cells uh, and individually on various cells. And the claim is that they actually play nicely, uh, play nicely with each other. So like if you have uh, something that's, um, or I guess you can also say it, no, I don't know. I think maybe that's, that's the best, that's the best way to say it, I think. So you can say that uh, you have, um, so you have the action of a torus you can require uh, uh, things to be, like, Zima, maybe can I tell you what my concern is? Yes. So if I'm uh, if I'm doing a very similar uh, procedure and characteristic, like uh, you know using uh, usual geometry, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. like having characteristic zero on a semi-simple group, and I just uh, consider something like equivalent de modules mm -hmm. uh, with respect to on degenerate character, everything is complex, then the torus doesn't act. No, it doesn't act. I think just the diffusion. I don't think it acts. Yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, you, you just, but you define uh, it to be uh, the subcategory generated by the image of the averaging function. Well, I mean, that's oh, okay. one way to say, but it, it's also like, let, let's look at the finite group. You have, uh, if you take, uh, so, so you have double corsets for B indexed by W. If instead of B you consider U, each of those double corsets becomes a torus. And you know what it means, uh, well, you know what it means for a sheaf uh, on this torus to be, um, for a sheaf on the torus to be monodromic. Okay. But yeah, I, I mean, I agree that this is, it's like I cannot quite fit it into uh, into the uh, framework. Like it, it, it seems a, a little bit ad hoc. Uh, I, I agree with the last statement. Yes, but you can also do what um, what uh, Roma suggested. Somehow the point is that what what is important. For this story, you don't really need this entire category B. Um, you only need to know that you, you can only consider the image of convolution of uh, W with itself. So in this, um, in this picture, 
this means that I don't really need to know the entire G. Like if I'm going to take the fiber product of point with itself over something, I don't need to know this entire thing. It's enough to know just formal neighborhood of this point. And so, yeah, so maybe the most canonical way to do this would be um, one, well, a way to do this would be to say, okay, you know what, instead of imposing this monodromic condition, so instead of imposing this monodromic condition, let's replace it by an even smaller category, which is just generated by, uh, by convolution of this guy with itself. But I guess, well, that's one reason why it's work in progress. You'll have to make sure the, what the best statement is. Okay, thanks. But going off of this, so this was all to sort of make this m lower shriek equal m lower star, right? Is yes. it possible that this is true on the entire Uhori Whitaker category? I don't think so, but I don't see why it would be true. I mean, you. Part, but the problem is that um, part of it, like if you are integrating this uh, convolution, like if you look at this entire by Whitaker thing. Uh, it in, contains torus inside of it. And this fails for torus because, uh, because example. Formally, because, we want G to be reductive. And then if, you know, if G is GL1, then by Whitaker. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the other way. So this picture can be thought of as a special case uh, of by Whitaker for GM. Hmm. I was hoping to use this these compactification arguments that we discussed, but I guess maybe this doesn't apply. In this I case. think here it's slightly different because um, because the degeneracy condition on uh, the degeneracy condition on this character is different. So this when we talk about so this is not the um, when we talk about non-degenerate character for psi non psi being non-degenerate, it's non-degenerate but in the sense of the finite uh, group G. So in other words, in this story, like if you think about this from the katz uh, setting, this psi is slightly degenerate. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So this character knows about A12, but it doesn't care about A21. Mm -hmm. While, you know, the, the root diagram for the uh, Lie algebra is this too. I mean, I don't know, does it? Yeah, happy, happy with that, thanks. Sorry if that was a little bit cryptic. It's just yeah, but but I maybe the, there is a uh, like I think the bottom line is that um, part of the struggle here is this uh, that in order to have reasonable so when we're dealing with this reasonable Whittaker category, the uh, in its Iwahori version, this uh, what I call the non-degenerate character. Uh, is um, not the most, <laughs> like there are more non-degenerate characters of the corresponding group, but those, uh, they, the, but they won't have any fixed vectors in the, in the um, spherical setting. So that, this, it doesn't, the theory, right? yes. But in that, in that theory, I think we would, the, we would not have to, like we would not need the previous discussion. We would not need to worry about the unipotence about, I think then the convolution would be, would be right on the nose. Like this by, by not by Whittaker, this, uh, I always forget how to pronounce this word. This by, well, that, uh, yeah. So that, yes, epipelagic. This, uh, uh, by version would be uh, uh, would satisfy the properness condition on the nose without any yeah. extra condition. Any, any more questions? Add, just to continue on the um, on the basic questions on this mm -hmm. bioethical business, so. 
Um, do I understand correctly? So in the setting of Bezrel Kavnikov Yun, you kind of you it's only on on these kind of free free monodromic things that m star equals m shriek or something. Mm -hmm. Is that I think so, that, that's correct. So I should think that on your slide where you were before, before you moved. Um, I, I've been moving in all random directions. <laughs> so probably here somewhere, like, yeah, well, well this discussion of- Oh, that's the one, yeah. There yeah, the, well, all this, yeah. So I should think about these as kind of being um, free monodromic in, in the Taurus direction and Whittaker in each of the- Well, I'm one? not- I, I, but being free is not really important for this uh, Shriek being star into star. Being monodromic is important. Yeah, I mean, you. I, is the question about whether monodromy has to be unipotent or not? Uh, no, it was more just the ah, fact that, yeah, no, like, I that the cohomology of C star is, you know, not the compactly supported cohomology of C star. Yes. Right. The, 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 yeah, there's a, a, certainly when we say uh, star equals to shriek, it's up to a shift, which has to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has to be built in. Yes. Thank you. Now, now I now I understand what the. Um, all right. So maybe maybe a good point is that yes, that we need to know in this uh, formal statement. I need to know that the two versions of uh, uh, that the two versions are co uh, coincide in the sense that there exists an isomorphism, but I'm not uh, I'm not picky about which specific isomorphism it is, and the claim is that. Uh, uh, like, for, for example, when you work with the torus, uh, if you consider monodromic, um, if you consider monodromic sheaves on the torus, then these uh, versions will co will be uh, will coincide, although they the sh the shift will be different than if uh, we had something proper in place of the torus. Well, a very naive way to think about it, maybe there's a better way, is just that. Um... Uh, for a monodromic sheaf, right, taking uh, derived global sections, well, it's, uh, it's like taking derived invariants invariant. of monodromy, and uh, well, basically it can be computed by a Kazoo complex, which is self dual. So, that's... so in one dimension, the, uh, if you have a Z module, invariants and coinvariants are going to be. Right. Thanks. But yeah, self dual up to a shift, which we just discussed. Derived invariants and derived co invariants. After a shift. Any more questions? Could you go to your second to last slide uh, where you? Sort of. Can you can you describe the, the content? The, the what? Uh, I think it's like the second to last slide or something where you put together the ingredients to get. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, sorry. A back one. Um, yeah. Just sort of wondering, like. Uh, so, why why was it okay to ignore the unipotence condition when you're making this calculation for the Hecke category in the end? Uh, because it's a condition about, <laughs> it's the same reason why I only, I only need to know the formal, mm. like the unipotence condition basically says that this category, uh, in, this, uh, in the description of this category, this uh, uh, entire G check should be replaced by the formal neighborhood of the unipotent code. So it's a set theoretic condition rather than scheme theoretic condition. So it's a formal neighborhood condition. But for the purposes of a fiber product, it's only, in fact, I don't even need the formal neighborhood of the unipotent cone. I just need to know the formal neighborhood of this one point. I see. Um, yeah. And just uh, sort of wondering about this passage to this causal dual version, like does that, uh, you're saying that only works in fairly large characteristics? I mean, I, I mean you have to be careful. 
it. So uh, I honestly, I haven't thought about it. I agree that it works in the large characteristic. I cannot, I'm not sure. Well, I guess at the very least you want, um, well, as they say, quasi log, right? Ident identification. Right. Oh. That, that's one thing. Yeah, et al. Yeah. isomorphism between the algebra. Equi equi conjugation equivariant et al. isomorphism between the algebra and uh, the group near identity. It certainly exists. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, right. much of the time, but maybe not always. Yeah, may maybe that's a good point. Um, but that's, I don't know if that's the only thing you need. Well, but I mean, then the, there's the next step when you do, when you look at the Kazul duality. I mean, there'll be, will you get the symmetric power? Will you get, I mean, I, 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 I can't. I and mean, that's the usual business of um, symmetric powers and finite characteristic, but maybe, yeah. but if, if characteristic is more than the, uh, I, I suspect that if the characteristic is more than the uh, dimension of the group, is greater than the dimension of the group, then both of those, Things should probably work, but yeah. Anyway, um, and you have to be careful. I <laughs> short summary. I have a silly question. So um, you talked about rigidity in the beginning, and um, yes. Well, I was uh, worried. I mean, this rigidity implies that uh, a junction between. Uh, product with your object and product with a dual, but it's stronger, right? So in general, I right? think it's equivalent. If you it's like require, by, by I think junction? if hmm? you need by junction now. I mean, I, I you might need. I mean, the question is whether you want the uh, the equivalence to be. I think we discussed it. So. Yes, but oh. well. Then I then I consider this a trick question and refuse okay. to answer. So if you refuse to answer that question, maybe I could ask another one, which is um my internet dropped out um exactly mm -hmm. at the crucial point of discussing this tensor product. Um <laughs> All right. Like, I I just came in when you decided that there was some interesting question or something, and then moved moved on. Uh huh. <laughs> um, all right. So, so this this stuff or uh, so just a tensor product in the abstract setting or something more. Can I mean what like so this 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 tensor product is some. Um, infinity categorical thing. And then mm -hmm. I think you were saying something like, uh, because of where we only care about isomorphisms. All right. no well, no, I, I was talking about why you don't, I don't know if it was anything particularly important. I was just saying that uh, when you talk about the tensor product, you don't need to know, you don't need to think about the two category the, or infinity two categories, a category of categories. It's enough to work with infinity one. So that's that's the short summary. And in down to earth terms, that means that in order to formulate the so tensor product is constructed, defined by universal property. And the universal property doesn't requ doesn't require knowing what a morphism between functors, what a morphism between functors, which is not an isomorphism, is. So, in, so the formulation of the universal property only requires um, natural transformations that are isomorphisms. That's, I don't know if that's related to, uh, to what you were interested in. Thank you, yeah, I can digest that. Any more questions? So, 
it's not a question. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to say that in the notes, there are uh, two side remarks at the end, one related to normalization and uh, or this renormalization uh, and uh, another uh, some kind of general categorical discussion of uh, like, I guess, another summary. So uh, so this is, um, I hope that they are understandable from the notes if, um, um, well, if you're interested in those things, uh, but uh, I'll be also, if you look at them later and then you have some questions about those, I'll be happy to discuss them by email or whatever way works. Okay, great. Let's thank Dima again for that very interesting talk.